a visit with a person of high strangeness. A few years ago, um, I ran into these two wonderful people, Patricia Michael and Tom Stahl. And um, Patricia's a prosecutor, and Tom is a uh, Tom Stahl is a, an attorney, and also a wheat farmer Easter. Uh, East, in Eastern Washington. Over the years we have become great friends and have done a lot of things together. And so anyway, what I wanted to do is, um, is share an interview with you that we did uh, several years ago. In the meantime, what I have done over the years, I've taken information from this show and uh, I taught a class on jury duty. Uh, every time I go somewhere uh, that is what I would do, a free class and uh, was really welcomed by many. And so we're going to go and uh, remind you that what held true then holds true now and prepare you for what you can do and what you can't do when you go on a jury. And I'd like to let you know this is a two-parter and that next week we will continue this and um, so, come right along, you're getting ready to go on a jury. This, this young lady here, her name is Patricia Mitchell. Michael. Michael? Yes. What can I say? <laughs> I'm well, sorry. It's, it's Czechoslovakian, so you're excused. <laughs> then it would have been Mitchell, because an I is an E. In Czechoslovakia, it's pronounced Michal, but we've anglicized it somewhat. Okay. But you were pretty close. So and I made a whole new word out of it. <laughs> and this is Tom. Yes, I'm Tom Stahl. Stahl. I can mm -hmm. say that. And uh, you came a long ways today, Tom. I did. I came uh, from Central, actually not today, but it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. I came from Central Washington, came from my parents' house in Ellensburg. They live in Ellensburg. Mm -hmm. And then before that, I came from Waterville, where I live, mm -hmm. which is even farther, a little bit to the north, a little bit more to the east up in a uh, wheat, f wheat farming country mm -hmm. on the Big Bend country of the Columbia River where the Columbia makes a big kind of uh, um, curve around this area of land which is on a high plateau overlooking the river. And on this plateau they farm wheat and barley and oats and it's um, a dry land farming. They depend on the snow in the winter, hope it melts into the ground the right way and then uh, hope it doesn't get so hot so quickly that it all evaporates out and that's going to make the crop. That would be a perfect place for a crop circle so we can't just leave send that out there and maybe they'll send you one this year and then you have to come back. How's that? Oh, it, it would be great but I would rather it was a crop circle on my neighbor and his crop is laying down and I can go see it and be there but I don't have to try to cut that crop and lift that crop up. So I don't think the combines can do it. Can well, it? the whole thing is they now have alien insurance and crop circle insurance and there's so many wonderful things connected with that that you probably wouldn't lose anything because people would come from everywhere. So let's put it out there. I'm talking to Dorsey and Souter tomorrow then about getting this alien crop uh, insurance, yeah. especially if you guys are sending me a crop circle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can promise it, but let's aim for that. So. Um, and then you, in your spare time, what would you, do you like to do? Well, I love to ski in my spare time. Ah. I don't have a lot of spare time, but mm -hmm. um, I'm an attorney, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm a member of the Fully Informed Jury Association, and I'm on the board, which mm -hmm. I've been on for the last four years. Mm -hmm. So I have a very burning interest in the jury system in our country. And I also do enjoy traveling, and um, we do a lot of snowmobiling, mm -hmm. so I guess you could say I really love the snow and I love the winter. Well, cool. So anyway, this summer maybe you can get to go see his crop circle whenever it arrives. How's oh, that? I'll be more than happy. Uh, yeah. I love the uh, area that Tom farms. Mm -hmm. The wheat farms in eastern Washington are really beautiful. Yeah. I want to say something about our opening shot and then we're going to get to the subject at hand. Um, Margaret Brennan, my friend that uh, does so many opening shots for us, she uh, created that for us and in the meantime was nice enough, I believe you have that, where it ended up in your book. That's right, yes. You have it, no? Uh, this is the uh, second edition of the book uh, by 
Justice William Goodloe, or it's a small book, an essay by Justice William Goodloe, um, entitled Jury Nullification, Empowering the Jury as the Fourth Branch of Government. We will get into a little bit later what that means, but I would like to show you how the third edition will open. It will open with your friend's illustration that she donated. Yeah, there it is. There it is. And okay, if I can get you to hold that still yes. for a minute. So we can see that, and it came out, um, came out really good. Let's see. Let, let's see. Can we? There it is. Now, now we can see it. Yeah. So that worked out wonderful, and thank you for considering that, and she was really pleased about that. Okay. And we'll have some copies of these books for her. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where would we like to start? Um, I'll put it. Ladies first, I'll put it in your ballpark okay. here. Where would you like to start with the show today? Well, I think we should start with a definition of uh, jury nullification. Mm -hmm. uh, we're both members of the board of the Fully Informed Jury Association, and what we're all about is to inform jurors mm -hmm. of their rights and their duties as jurors. Mm -hmm. And the main uh, thrust is that the jury has the right to judge not only the facts of every case that they sit on, but they have the right and the duty to also judge the law and how mm -hmm. we're applying the law in that particular case. Mm -hmm. So the jury has to take a very wide view of what's going on in the trial. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to look at the jury as the buck stops with the jury. Exactly. Yeah. They're the last bastion. They are what separates the citizen, the mm -hmm. defendant, that's on trial from that cruel, hard instrument of the criminal law coming down on them, like the guillotine. The jury is the body of citizenry that sits in judgment and decides whether the state would make this person a prisoner, put them in a cage, mm -hmm. a prison, for a lengthy period of time, or whether there should be mercy shown, or whether there's even ever been a crime committed. Committed, yeah. And unfortunately, that doesn't work out that way sometimes. So I'm going to go to you, Tom, because if I remember correctly, you were pretty, um, uh, n you knew quite a bit of how that started in the first place when, um, when what was the judge's name? Um, William Goodlow? Goodlow, yes. He William went Goodlow. to England, did he not? That's uh, right. That's the story I'm after that's here. That's right. Um, first, I'd like to add a little bit to the definition, then I'll talk about Justice Goodlow's trip to England. Um, a, a lawyer uh, about 150 years ago who lived uh, during the Civil War and before the Civil War, an abolitionist lawyer, Lysander Spooner, he defined the jury's roles as several. And he said they have to judge what are the facts. The jury has to judge what is the law. The jury should judge what is the moral intent of the accused, what is in the accused's mind, what's in the accused's heart. And he said the primary and paramount purpose, the very most important purpose and duty of the jury is to judge of the justice of the law, whether the law is just. Not just to judge, does a law exist, what does that law say, but to judge, is this law a just law? Is it promoting justice? If it is not in their case, they should then acquit. They should find the defendant not guilty if they judge the law itself to be unjust. And that leads me to Justice Goodlow's trip to England. Mm -hmm. Because after he was elected to the Washington State Supreme Court in 1984, he and his wife Ruth took a trip to England. And they went to London. And they went to a courthouse called Old Bailey. And there had been, it's an old, old courthouse. There had been many trials throughout history in this uh, courthouse, in this court uh, building. But only one is commemorated by a plaque, and the plaque still stands today, and it commemorates the trial of William Penn. And you may, uh, that name may be familiar. He founded Pennsylvania. Uh, he later founded Philadelphia. But he was a young man in England, and he was a Quaker. And there was a law in England that said you could not practice any religion except the Church of England. Mm -hmm. But he was a Quaker, and he was going to practice his religion. He felt it was his right, and so he did. He preached a Quaker sermon to an unlawful assembly of other people, uh, basically an unlawful church, and he had to do it in the street because the police had locked him out of his own church and wouldn't let yeah, him in his exactly. church yeah. even. So he preached that sermon, and then they arrested him and another man with him, William Meade, and they were arrested for violating the Conventicle Act, 
which made it a crime to preach any religion other than the Church of England. Well, the jury is seated in this case, and it took place, I'll give you the year, in 1670, um, before the United States was even a country. There were colonies, but we, the United States was not a country yet. And the jurors were listened to the testimony. Uh, William Penn admitted he had preached the Quaker sermon. The judges read the statute to the jury and said, there's nothing for you to do but convict them. Here's the statute. They plainly violated it. They, they preached this Quaker sermon. And the jury said no. They said basically, well, we can look at the facts two ways. On the basis of these facts, either the defendants are guilty, or on the basis of these facts, the law is wrong. Mm -hmm. And they voted to acquit. And the judges wouldn't have it. Sent them back time and, a time and time again to deliberate. And they kept coming back with a not guilty verdict. So finally, the judges accepted that not guilty verdict. And they let William Penn go. And then he later went on to found Pennsylvania. But the jury was then thrown in prison and punished for their verdict because mm -hmm. they had given a verdict according to their conscience but against the judge's instruction and against the law. Yeah. What happened was they were finally exonerated. And there is a plaque commemorating their courage and commemorating that trial as it reestablished in England the right of jurors to vote their conscience. When Justice Goodloe saw that plaque, all of a sudden, he realized how much our rights, all of our rights, depend on the jury's mm -hmm. uh, ability to vote their conscience and on their independence. And that's why he later set out to write this essay. Right. And so now we're going to bring it to a little more recent time. And uh, because I found that there's so few people that understand that they have the right to vote by conscience, even though they might get threatened with some consequences along the line, that is actually the way a jury should vote. And so I'll let you add um, anything to that, a current case or something, or if you need to elaborate on what Tom said, go right ahead. Well, just picking up from what Tom said, uh, historically then, mm -hmm. when we transferred or accepted the laws, the common law of England, of England. into this mm -hmm. country, what we meant when we used the word jury in our Constitution, mm -hmm. and is mentioned many times in the Constitution, how many? Uh, three times. It's mm -hmm. in three separate places in the yes. Constitution. It's in the main body of the Constitution and in the um, Sixth Amendment and the Seventh Amendment. Mm -hmm. So when we were using the term jury, mm -hmm. the definition of jury that our founding fathers gave it was that it's a body of citizens, mm -hmm. usually 12, that would sit in judgment of the law as yeah. well as the facts. So today we have a very distorted uh, use of the term jury. We really don't have juries today. Arguably, every case that is heard mm -hmm. where the instruction is given that the jury cannot look at the law, they have exactly. to accept it blindly, yeah. that's not really a jury. Mm -hmm. And yeah. arguably, those really aren't legal trials because what we have in our Constitution is uh, a jury with a panoply of rights mm -hmm. to, to look at everything and to, um, to judge the law. There are other ways we, we shut the jury.